Oh no, I'm on mute. Oh no, people can't hear me. Ah! Um, so I got word after posting one of my lesson videos from module 11 that the second half of the video did not have any audio to it, which to me means that while I was recording that video, um, my recorder crashed. And then when I reopened it, it must have left me on mute. It must have turned my microphone off. Um, and so I apologize for that. And I also thank the people who made me aware of that. Um, I will reshoot the video and re-edit it in the future. But what I wanted to do at least now is give you um, the part that you missed. All right, so um, that being said, I thought I would jump in and do that. So this was from lesson three of module 11, and I will actually label this video as lesson three, part two, um, the you're on mute special edition. And let's jump in and actually pick up where my microphone left off. So what, were we, what we were talking about initially in module three, or sorry, in, in lesson three of module 11, was the cap and trade program of California. The cap and trade program is basically a program that's designed to reduce emissions. And it does so by allocating a certain amount of, mission, of emissions to each and every industry and each and every company that is responsible for emitting carbon dioxide. And basically what it says is you can only emit this much. Now, if you emit less than that, so, so that, that amount, that's your cap. If you emit less than that, you can take that excess allowance and sell it to another company to make money. On the other hand, if you end up using more, if you end up going over your cap, you have to purchase allowances from other companies. Um, and there's actually precedent that the cap and trade program works. And that precedent actually comes from the East Coast of the United States. So I've mentioned before that acid rain is a big issue on the East Coast of the United States because their electricity production relies a lot more on coal than the West Coast of the United States. One of the negatives of using coal is that there are a lot of impurities in coal, including sulfur. And so when burning that coal, what actually happens is sulfur reacts with oxygen to produce sulfur dioxide, which then when reacting with water becomes sulfuric acid. That sulfuric acid then rains back down to the surface of the earth, causing acid rain. Well, this has been a big problem on the Eastern half of the United States. Um, forests have died because of this. Ecosystems have been affected. Um, infrastructure has been crumbled. Um, Buildings have eroded. There have been all kinds of problems, both human related problems as well as natural problems due to acid rain. Well, in the mid 2000s, they decided to do something about it. Particularly, 10 Northeastern United States states, um, and they're on this map in purple, said, We are going to do something about this. We are going to implement a cap and trade program on coal, on the using of coal. It was named the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. And basically what it was, was it was a cap on how much coal you're allowed to use and how much stuff you're allowed to emit. And just like on the West Coast of the United States, the idea is that you're only allowed to Use, use a certain amount. If you use more than that certain amount, you have to pay for it. If you use less than that certain amount, you can sell. That incentivizes the free market to then go, okay, well, if we can produce more efficient power generation methods and maybe rely more on renewables, that reduces our, or that reduces how much we use, we can then sell the excess allowances to pay for that to pay for that cleaner electricity generation. And that's essentially what's happened in the Northeast of the United States. Um, 
a major decrease of covered emissions um, of nearly 50%. So almost half has occurred because of this. Um, and this has also generated over $3 billion in economic growth for the region. So it's actually been good for the economy and good for the environment. The other big side effect, the other big benefit is that it has significantly improved the pH of rainfall in that area. Let me explain what I mean. So pH is, um, it is a scale, it's actually called potential for hydrogen. And basically what it refers to is um, how many hydrogen ions are present. Um, that goes way beyond the scope of this course. But basically what I do want you to know is the lower the score, the more acidic it is. So a score of four is more acidic than a score of five. A score of five is more acidic than a score of six. A score of seven is what's considered neutral. Anything higher than that is what's considered basic. Not that kind of basic. Um, and most water is slightly acidic. And the reason why is because of carbon dioxide in the air, it absorbs some of the carbon dioxide. Um, but the average pH of rainfall here on the Western half of the United States is in the higher fives and the sixes. Well, on the Eastern half of the United States, prior to the cap and trade program becoming a thing, pHs were down in the mid fours, lower fours, and then even in some cases, the higher threes. In short, the rainfall in the Eastern half of the United States was far more acidic. And that could be indicated by these brighter oranges and reds over here, indicating pHs of below 4.1. So really low pHs, all things considered. Really, really acidic rainfall. Now let's watch what actually happens over time. This was in 2002, the shading changed a little bit, the, the color shadings that they used changed a little bit, but the overall effect really didn't change much. Um, still numerous locations, especially in the Northeast United States with pHs in the low fours and the upper threes. And once again, Western coast of the United States, a lot less acidic. Um, pH is above 5.7. And so, yeah, um, high, or less acidic rainfall on the Western half of the United States, more acidic rainfall on the Eastern half. This was in 2002. The cap and trade program was approved and signed on in 2005, and then it took effect over the next few years. Let's see what happens. Here's 2008. So still pretty low pHs over in the greater, um, in the greater Northeast of the United States. 2014, all those lower fours start to go away and we actually now are starting to see upper fours and even lower fives in much of the, North, in much of the Northeast. 2018, those upper fours are almost completely gone and replaced with lower and mid fives. Now the pH is on the eastern half of the United States, well, still lower than the West Coast. And remember, a lower pH indicates more acidity. Um, even though they're still lower, they are substantially improved from where they were 15, 20, 25 years ago. What that goes to show is that this works. The cap and trade program works. And in fact, it's worked so well that a few other states on the eastern part of the United States, specifically Maryland, Virginia, um, have basically said, we want in, we want to join in this because it's benefiting the economy and it's benefiting the environment. So that gives us a lot of hope here in California for our cap and trade program. And the fact of the matter is that 
we have been instituting this cap and trade program for a little over the past 10 years. And it, it has actually shown tremendous improvement in our carbon dioxide emissions. Another big thing that has shown tremendous improvement in our carbon dioxide emissions is our renewable energy portfolio. Um, the original goal of AB 32, the California Global Warming Solutions Act, was to have a 50% renewable energy portfolio by 2030. We have made leaps and bounds in the last decade. In the last decade, we have gone from less than 1% of our energy being generated by solar panels to almost 20%. Wind farms have grown substantially. Um, our dependence, our use of renewable technologies has gotten way better. Um, and so we here in California have greatly improved our renewable energy portfolio. And in fact, so much so that um, Governor Jerry Brown in the late 20 teens before Gavin Newsom became governor, um, he actually signed another bill, um, sort of an attachment bill that basically said, you know, we're doing so well. Instead of shooting for 50, we're gonna shoot for 60. And so the goal now is that we would like to have a 60% renewable energy portfolio by 2030. Gavin Newsom has actually come out and said, um, other than shutting us down due to COVID, he's also come out and said, actually, I want to see us at 100% by 2045. That is really ambitious, but I honestly say let's go for it. If you can't, um, you can't reach the moon if you don't shoot for the stars. So even if we don't hit that number, I think it's a really, really good goal to, uh, to, to strive for. Um, so key achievements, um, as I mentioned, um, we have seen substantial improvement in our solar portfolio. Um, we've greatly reduced our reliance on natural gas, which is really important because natural gas requires fracking in many cases. And fracking is having major problems with um, our water table, as well as causing earthquakes. And there's all kinds of ecological and environmental problems with fracking. Um, if you don't remember, that was back in module nine. Um, and the doubling of our wind farm generation. So we have seen a substantial improvement in our renewable energy portfolio. We are doing really, really well. Um, that being said, there are also some key challenges. One of the biggest key challenges is um, the jury has still been out somewhat on whether hydroelectricity generation is considered renewable. Here in California, that's especially true because we have in the past roughly 10, 15 years, seen a big increase in the occurrence of drought. Drought is becoming more common here. And because drought is becoming more common here, our ability to actually produce electricity from hydro um, generation becomes less. We have less water, therefore we have weaker rivers, we have emptier reservoirs. Um, that means there's not as much water flowing through our dams, not as much water flowing through our dams means not as much electricity generation. Um, and so that is a big issue. And then I kind of put this in here though, um, at the point, at the time that I'm actually recording this video, um, our economic situation here in California has actually really been looking up lately. Um, but there still is an uncertain economic future due to COVID-19. We are still trying to figure out how is a post-COVID world gonna look like? Now, depending on when you watch this video, we might be fully out of the pandemic. We might have a little bit better of a picture. Um, the picture is definitely a lot rosier now than it was a year ago. Um, it's definitely a lot rosier than it was six months ago. So um, things are looking up, but we still have some stuff that we need to figure out. And so that could greatly impact our ability to, um, to nail 
that 60% renewable energy portfolio by 2030. Um, because doing that requires a lot of investment. And at a time when unemployment's really high, tax revenues are down, and there's a lot of uncertainty, it's a lot harder to invest in our renewable energy portfolio. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to show here, I don't have enough time to go over all of these, um, but these are actually a number of really cool climate resources. Um, this, these links are active on the PDF of this lesson. So um, if you're curious to learn more about any of these, I recommend opening up the lesson and clicking on these links. Um, these include Climate Smart San Jose, which is um, a action plan that has been developed by San Jose City Hall to, um, to actually make San Jose more climate conscious. I will give one big criticism of this program. They have seemed very wishy-washy about it. What I mean by that is um, it used to be called something else. It was like the San Jose Green Vision like five years ago. And then they were providing updates and then they stopped providing updates and it kind of went away. And then this showed up and then it sort of disappeared for a year and now it's back. Um, and so I think San Jose has been a little wishy-washy about this. Um, but some other really good Bay Area conservation efforts, not just government run, but also um, public and private run include things such as the San Francisco Bay, uh, Bay Keeper, Sea Change San Mateo County, 350 Bay Area. So 350 is actually considered by many to be the highest acceptable carbon dioxide concentrations. Um, just to remind you, we're closer to 420 now. Um, 350 parts per million. Um, the SPUR, San Francisco Bay Area Planning and Urban Research Association. Um, and then I also provided a link here with more information about California AB 32. Um, where I teach full-time De Anza College, they actually offer a whole course that you could take through the Environmental Studies Program on California climate change policy really, really worth checking out if you have the chance to do it. And that's pretty much it for this, um, this lesson. I am making sure that my microphone's on now, so hopefully we don't see this again. Um, I will be uploading this shortly, and thank you all to all the people who let me know that the other video had some problems. Everything looked fine when I uploaded so, um, but thank you for letting me know. And that's that.